Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional and rightful owners of this land. Nation, a large body of people united by a common descent, history, culture or language, inhabiting a particular state or territory. Mr President, I move the following motion. That the Senate acknowledges the historic action of the Holt Government with bipartisan support for the Australian Labor Party in initiating the dismantling of the White Australia policy. Recognises that since 1973 successive Labor and Liberal National Party governments have, with bipartisan support, pursued a racially non-discriminatory immigration policy to the overwhelming national and international benefit of Australia. And three, gives its unambiguous and unqualified commitment to the principle that whatever criteria are applied by Australian governments in exercising their sovereign right to determine the composition of the immigration intake, race, faith or ethnic origin shall never explicitly or implicitly be among them. The White Australia Policy is the name given to the Immigration Restriction Act of 1901 and subsequent acts. It was a formal policy of keeping Australia a homogenous white European country. It was one of the very first pieces of legislation passed into Australian law. It is an important part of Australia's history, yet the ruling elite demonise it as racist and mobigoted. What's that, buddy? Why do you reckon, short bus? Uh, because they don't like white people? Correct. The White Australia policy is arguably the most maligned and slandered policy in Australian history. The ruling class even thinks stating they want the White Australia policy automatically counts as criticism. But is this actually warranted? Is the White Australia policy just an evil, racist, bigoted act that should only ever be criticised? Or were there good reasons for having it? Why the White Australia policy existed in the first place is something nobody ever talks about or discusses. The truth is, abandoning it isn't just destroying our country, it's actually a direct violation of the constitution. It is the founding principle of our nation. In fact, it is the reason Australia exists as a united federation in the first place. Think of the white Australia policy. Well, I think it's a good and they should really have it and keep out the coloured racists. The white Australia policy, well, I think you have to live in a country with coloureds before you can decide upon it. Um, people here don't live with Aboriginals, do they? But in New York, they live side by side with colours. I come from New York, and uh, I wouldn't care to have them living in the same house as me. Uh, in what respect? Well, do you think it should be discontinued at this stage, or...? No, I don't. I think it should be continued. Even more forcefully, perhaps? Even more forcefully. Why, why is that? Oh, well, I believe in uh, the way things are at present. They are, uh, uh, when you take into consideration what's happening overseas in South Africa and those places, we seem to be very well off here. In 1962, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation still had a vestige of journalistic integrity. They asked the people of Australia what they thought of the White Australia policy. The overwhelming majority thought it was a good idea, with most of those in favour being highly in favour of it. It will give you a good understanding of how people saw this policy in a time before the silencing of dissent by the bullying of a politically correct media class. I'll link to the full video in the description. It's worth watching. My favourite's the last guy. <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind, the ABC produced this video just four years before the Holt government decided to change our immigration laws without our consent. In 1975, the Whitlam government completely dismantled the White Australia policy and introduced the Racial Discrimination Act. This act made it illegal to offend or humiliate someone based on race in a direct attack on free speech. The ruling class now refuse to remove it because it gives them control and rulers love nothing more than that. When it comes to claims of racial discrimination, white people need not apply. Well said, Professor. In order to discover the truth, we need to look at history and find out exactly why Australia had this policy in the first place. On January 26, 1788, 
the first fleet of British ships arrived at the Australian continent to create the colony of New South Wales. The territory was mostly empty aside from a few very primitive natives. There were no roads, no civilization, and no written law. Founded as a penal colony with some freemen, the first settlers of New South Wales made their way in a brutal and unforgiving foreign land. They built a town, farms, they explored the local area and had their livestock repeatedly stolen by the natives. It was a tough life in this vast and unknown continent. In the period from 1788 to the mid-18th century, settlers founded the colonies of Western Australia, South Australia and Queensland, while Tasmania and Victoria seceded from New South Wales. These were British colonies created by British people and were subject to the British Crown. In 1851, a man named Hargrave struck gold in New South Wales. Later that year, James Regan and John Dunlop discovered the richest goldfield in the world and the Australian gold rush began. Word spread quickly around the world as people flocked to the continent to find their fortune. Amongst those seeking to benefit from this discovery were the Chinese who flooded Australia en masse and soon came into conflict with the British locals. The Chinese would work longer hours for less pay than Europeans who rightly saw this as a threat to their livelihoods. Anti-Chinese sentiments spread across the country with anti-Chinese riots springing up regularly from 1857 to 1877. Famous Australian politician Jack Lang wrote about this period of Australian history in 1956. Trouble broke out between the diggers and the Chinese on the Lambing Flat Fields in July 1861. The tough diggers attacked the Chinese and used strong arm methods. There were all kinds of wild threats. The government ordered troops into the fields including artillery and in the riots that followed one digger was killed. The miners then decided to take an interest in politics with the elimination of the Chinese as their first objective. Lambing Flat is in fact just as significant in the history of the Labour Party in this state as Eureka Stockade was in Victoria. Some of the mining companies had discovered that the Chinese were prepared to work for longer hours for much lower wages than Australians. That was the chief reason why they were resented. Trouble spread to the shipping companies and there were strikes brought about by the employment of Chinese on Australian ships. Chinese were also coming into Australian ports, deserting and starting their own businesses. Parks saw what was happening in Sydney. He announced that he was against further Chinese immigration. He was attacked by wealthy employers and accused of having a bias against the Chinese because they were coloured. Wow, so there were social justice warriors in the 19th century too? Yep, and they were even supported by big business for the same reasons they are today. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Like all government, the early Australian colonial governments were slow to respond to the will of the people. It wasn't until the first intercolonial conference of 1880 that serious need for immigration restrictions were proposed. For the next 20 years, the colonies worked towards federation, with the primary but not only reason being to keep out Chinese and other foreign workers. In 1900, Australia federated and the Commonwealth Government was given power to legislate on immigration. In 1901, the Commonwealth passed the Immigration Restriction Act and this would soon form into what we now know as the White Australia Policy. Australia's first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, had this to say on the matter, and I quote, I need make no apology for calling this one of the most important matters with regard to the future of Australia. And the second PM, Alfred Deakin, had this to say on race. Unity of race is an absolute essential to the unity of Australia. There are plenty more quotes from both about race and the Australian nation, but it is wiser simply to link to them in the description as snowflake sensors are always lurking. <laughs>
Jack Lang sums it up nicely. White Australia must not be regarded as mere political shibboleth. It was Australia's Magna Carta. Without that policy, this country would have been lost long ere this. It would have been engulfed in an Asian tidal wave. There would have been no need for the Japanese to invade this country. We would have been swallowed up by the rolling advance of a horde of coloured people anxious to escape the privations of their own countries and prepared to impose their own standards on this country. Don't forget to show people it's part of the constitution, Matty. I've actually mentioned this in previous videos because it's important to let Australians know just how our ruling class have betrayed us. Section 119 of the constitution is clear as day. The Commonwealth shall protect every state against invasion and on the application of the executive government of the state against domestic violence. Notice how it says the Commonwealth needs to protect every state from invasion and violence. That's because the founders didn't just mean military invasion by a foreign state. They actually meant the flooding of non-European peoples who may threaten the racial unity of the nation. The preamble also implies a white Australia. Whereas the people of New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland and Tasmania, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, have agreed to unite in one indissoluble federal commonwealth under the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and under the constitution hereby established. The correct interpretation is as the founding fathers intended and the white Australia policy is as Australian as the first and second amendments are American. No government can change this policy without a referendum supported by a majority of people in a majority of states. Wait, doesn't that mean every government since 1966 is in violation of the constitution? It certainly does. It also means every Governor General since then has failed in their primary duty, protecting the Australian Constitution. The result of this betrayal is an increasingly divided and dangerous country. We now have Islamic terrorism, an African crime epidemic, and ethnic enclaves have sprung up all over Sydney and Melbourne. Sydney and Melbourne CBDs are essentially Chinese colonies at this point. How about the traffic? Good point, short bus. Not only did our government open the borders to people who don't share our culture, values or heritage, they allowed in millions of them. Traffic in our two biggest cities is off the charts. Melbourne traffic is now worse than in New York. Wages are also stagnating while living costs rise and it's mostly due to the influx of foreign workers driving down wages. I made a video on this in my economic series called The Real Reason Australian Wages Are Not Growing. This is ultimately the point. Big business supports mass immigration from non-European countries because it gives them a cheap labour force at the expense of white locals the same reason they supported it in the 19th century. The difference being now multinational big businesses are in an unholy alliance with the globalist left that infests the media and academia. They are desperate to destroy all races and bring about a one world government controlled by a small group of elites. This means the demoralization and genocide of the white race and it's been going on since the 1960s. They tell us we have no culture and our heritage is one of evil colonialism and exploitation while they demonize and feminize the first line of defense, white men. This is pure evil and if you don't know who's behind it, well, you should have gone to Specsavers. Global financial oligarchs, corrupt politicians and multinational corporations hell-bent on turning the people of the world into consumer and tax cattle. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs>
This video is not to inspire hatred of non-whites. They are victims just as we are. It is to remind Australians of our birthright and to wake them up to the corruption and treason of our ruling elite who dominate the media, academia, business and politics for their own benefit. They act to the great disadvantage of humanity. The truth is abundantly clear. The White Australia policy is Australia. It's the very reason we are a federated nation. It's the whole reason for the Constitution and the Commonwealth Government. You don't have to like the truth, but if you wish to claim loyalty to our nation, you do have to accept it. I hope you enjoyed the video. Share the truth around, if you dare. And I'll see ya when I see ya. Yay! My first video of 2019. The star as usual. Nah, it was all me. What about the professor, short boss? Eh, shut up, Madalena. <laughs> Do you believe that the white, the so-called white Australia policy will always be a stumbling block? I don't think it's such a stumbling block as people pretend, but that it's important for us, I haven't the slightest doubt, that we should maintain it the way it is. As long as we possibly can, we ought to aim at having a homogeneous population. I don't want to see reproduced in Australia the kind of problem they have in South Africa, or in America, or increasingly in Great Britain. I think it's been a very good policy, and it's been of great value to us. Am I? I have read this, yes. Well, I'm, if I were not described as a racist, I'd be the only public man who hasn't been. Now, that's one of these jargons, isn't it? One of these mod words. Oh, baby, tell me, and tell me I'm your own. You call a man a racist.